I am going to start recording just so folks know. Okay. And I'll throw a, a welcome in the chat box. And first I'll fix my typos. <laughs> we'll get started in just a minute. Thank you, everybody that's here this evening. We are excited that you are here joining us on April Fool's Day. <laughs> I just can't even believe it's already April. Like, how did that happen? My husband and I always joke because our wedding anniversary is the 8th. And when we were looking at churches, we had a choice of April 1st or April 8th. And I said to my husband, and we got married in 2000. So a nice round number. And I said, you know, I'm all about round numbers to help you remember when our anniversary is, but I refuse to get married on April Fool's Day. Like that just <laughs> feels like that setting us up for- Fools in love. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and at first he's like, what's the big deal? Then I said, yeah, let's think about it for just a minute. He said, all right, yeah. it's April Fool's Day. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. I do. April Fool's. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, Camille asked, do we need to add our names to this chat for certificate purposes? Uh, no, you do not. I'll tell you what we will do is we're going to send out a follow up email, um, likely tomorrow to the attendees. And then what I can do is include um, kind of a generic certificate of attendance for tonight. So it'll be one that doesn't have your name um, typed on it, but you can put your name, but it'll have all the other information. So we'll send that out. But then if you need one that is specifically has your name on it printed by us, um, that's when you can reach out to us and say, this is good, but not good enough. So we can, um, in the follow-up email, I'll be sure to include a certificate of attendance. Okay, well, I will go ahead and, whoops, start us off. Uh, my name is Amy Combs, and I am the PTI Assistant Manager here at ECAC, the Exceptional Children's Assistance Center. And I know many of you may already be um, familiar with us, but those that aren't, I just wanted to share a little bit about ourselves. Uh, we are a private um, statewide nonprofit parent organization, and we are committed to improving the lives and education of all children um, through a special emphasis on children with disabilities and special health care needs. And so when Melissa Ratcliffe, the program director at our Children's Place of Coastal Horizon Center, um, contacted us about uh, essentially initially was, you know, sharing what the program um, that she's with, what they offer and what they've learned about children of incarcerated and returning parents. It was initially something uh, we were thinking of doing for just our staff, but then I said, you know what, that's important stuff. Um, and certainly um, we speak to parents um, and grandparents who maybe where the children's parents are incarcerated. And we certainly serve a lot of professionals as well um, that are likely engaging with children in this situation. And I said, that's an important topic. Let's not limit it to just our staff and let's open it up to the whole state. And so that is how this came about. So I am excited. Um, to be here learning with you and to pass the mic on to Melissa. Great. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for that kind explanation of how I ended up in front of all of you here this <laughs> evening. So thank you so much to all of you. Thank you for making time to be here. Um, I am going to do share screen in just a second um, so that we can um, have a chance to to talk a little bit further. But as you heard, my name is Melissa Radcliffe and I will talk in just a minute about our children's place. So if you hold on, I'm gonna do share screen and we will get things started.
Great. So um, I have started doing this. Um, I, I present to a lot of groups across the state. And one of the things I've started doing is I'm fine whether you leave your camera on or off. That's entirely up to you. But I'm just wondering if right now everyone can just turn their camera on if you have one and just do a quick wave, because I feel like I talk to a lot of screens, actually a lot of people you have. If you want to turn your I'd love to just do and see see some faces out there. So feel free to, to do that. And then when you're done, feel free to turn your camera off. That That's fine as well. So a well, couple- Well, sorry about that. I apologize. They're not free to do that. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> because, okay. Um, if we set it up as a Zoom meeting, then folks can do that. If we set it up as a webinar, I would literally have to make each of them a panelist to do so. So I apologize. We can't do that, but you can certainly um, use a reaction or raise a hand or throw something in the chat box. I apologize, we won't be able to see or hear you, we can, but you can utilize the Q&A in the chat box. Well, and I apologize for just being bold and going ahead and doing that. So what I will ask you to do is just wave, even if I can't see you, just wave, okay? And I'll know that you're waving to me, so thank you. Or you can put something in the chat box or a reaction, but I just like to know that I'm talking to people and not just screens and names, so. Um, a uh, couple of quick housekeeping items. So um, what I know from my PowerPoint is that it's usually too long, right? And I'm, and I'm trying really hard to cut slides or make things shorter, but what happens is emotionally attached to some of my slides. And I'll look at it and say, oh, you know, I should cut that, but it's such a cool color or credit, great graphic, or I work so hard on that. So what I find is that um, it's a resource that I'm happy to make available to folks afterwards, but know that some of the slides will go through pretty quickly. I'll, I'll probably pick an example or two from slides, but I want to make sure we get as possible this evening. So just know that if we you look at this and think, oh my gosh, there are a lot of slides. There is a lot of information, but I, I will make it available to folks afterwards. The second piece in terms of housekeeping is that I always think of this as the start of the conversation, but not the end. We have a bit of time here this evening, and I, I appreciate you setting aside some time to be here. Uh, but the reality is we could talk the rest of the day today and tomorrow into the weekend about children of incarcerated parents. But I think of this as the start of the conversation, but not necessarily the end. So when you log off this evening, my guess is this is going to go out of your brain. But when it comes back, if there are that we didn't talk about, you want more information, there was something that you had thought we were gonna talk about that we didn't, feel free to continue the conversation. And I, I put my contact information in the chat box already. It'll be the last slide and it shows up on a couple of other slides. But, but think about starting the conversation this evening, but how do you continue it as you go back to either your own personal lives or your professional lives? The other piece in terms of housekeeping is it looks like there's about 20 folks here tonight. And I know with a group of pretty much any size, but definitely 20, um, that statistically someone has had an experience with parental incarceration, whether that's something you're experiencing right now, you're caring for a child, you're an adult child, it was something happening when you were growing up. I point that out because for many folks, the many folks I talk to, they zoom in or jump in on teams or whatever the case, wearing a professional hat. And I know that the group I think is, is fairly professional heavy, but, but either way, folks wearing their professional hat. And I just point that out as sort of a self-care reminder that even if you are dealing and, and zoomed in with as a professional, to just know that this, if it's a personal experience, it can be tough to sit and listen and, and see words on a screen about an experience that you may have had. So just as a reminder that whether it's personal or professional, to do a little self-care if necessary, both now and afterwards, because it can be tough to listen to this particular topic. So we come to this from an advocacy perspective and not a clinical perspective. So I'm not a social worker. I'm not going to be giving that perspective. I'm the person who stands in front of groups across the state to say, when we think about all the things that kids are dealing with, is parental incarceration on that list? And more times than not, it's not on the list. And so what I'll say to folks is I'm going to issue a challenge. If you're not thinking about it, can you start? If you have been thinking about it, can you kind of up your game a bit, a bit, maybe get someone else to start thinking about it? Because wouldn't it be great if at some point when we said, let's look at the list, the list of all the things that kids might be dealing with, that parental incarceration is already there. We don't have to have that conversation. So thinking about um, putting on your advocacy hat and, and being part of that conversation. So there's a group that meets in Europe. Uh, they do an annual conference, which surprise, surprise, they didn't do in 2020. They decided not to go virtual. They said, we'll do something in 2021. And I always 
it doesn't matter how they do their conference. The reality is I probably am not going to Europe for a conference because that's not in my, going to Europe is not in my uh, budget for, for that to happen. But every time I get one of their emails about the conference, else, I'm always reminded of the tagline that they developed a few years ago during as they were pre uh, preparing for their conference. And they use the same tagline every year. And the first time, first couple of times I read it and had a chance to hear it and, you know, saw the words on an, in an email on a screen or whatever, I thought, wow, it's hard to imagine that they picked so few words to describe what is potentially such a big topic, a big part of a child's life has potentially big impacts. But the more I've had to share a chance to share it with groups, to say the words out loud, to hear a reaction, to hear my own reaction to it, I realized that they were so deliberate in picking those words that they really are very accurate in, in summarizing the experience of children. So the tagline for that group in Europe, the group that does an annual conference is not my crime, still my sentence. Not my crime, still my sentence. Children of incarcerated parents were not arrested. They didn't go before a magistrate. They didn't have a pretrial conference. They didn't hire a public defense, a defense attorney. They weren't assigned a public defender. They didn't have numerous court hearings. They didn't take a plea agreement. They weren't convicted by a judge or jury and they weren't sentenced. Yet many of them will tell you their experience, what's going on in their lives, their reactions feel like they're dealing with someone else's sentence not my crime, still my sentence. So I point that out, one, because I just feel like it does such a great job of capturing, but two, as a reminder to us that sometimes, if we're honest, we're not big fans of what the parents did. We don't like how they acted, the decisions they make. We feel like they just can't do anything right. They can't get their act together. And so I just remind folks that sometimes we need to step back from how we feel about the parents. We need to come back to that because of course the parents and the kids are connected, but to think about what the kids need in terms of how do we support them? Because they're not the ones who are technically experiencing yet they will tell you they feel as though they are. Not my crime, still my sentence. So just the last couple of very important housekeeping items. So on the right-hand side, on that bright green piece of paper, We were together, I would pass this out to you and it would be on, is there something you can do with this information right away? Now I put down in the next week, which might be a little bit aggressive, but something that you can do with the information before it goes away, right? How do you act on this? And I always say it's something that you can do immediately, something that doesn't require a million people to sign off on it and doesn't require a million dollars, right? Because you don't have either. But is there something that you could do right away with this information? And that little uh, purple flower in the middle is kind of stop a couple of times throughout to say, hey, let's start thinking about our homework. What can we do? Now, as you can see, the first one homework assignment is kind of done for you already. Hopefully nobody's on Facebook right now, but if you are, when we're done this evening, I would encourage you to check out our Facebook page. So I posted, I think two weeks ago that I would be doing this. I post anytime we're doing an event, but I also post if I hear of a new book, that is something that's gonna get posted tomorrow. If I hear of some new research, a new program, a new project, any of those things I post, but I also post around what I call hallmark moments. So I post around Valentine's Day, um, Halloween, Christmas, Mother's Day, Father's Day, as a reminder to all of us that those holidays, whatever swirling around, those holidays look and feel different for kids who have that incarcerated parent. Mother's Day looks a lot different for a child if mom's in jail. Father's Day feels a lot different if dad's in prison. So thinking about that. So that's your homework assignment. At the bottom, you'll see a stapler. That's a reminder for me to tell you that I do have a packet of handouts that I'm happy to make available to folks. Even if we were in person, I don't go through the handouts. They're another resource for you. So I'm happy to share that with folks. And then probably the most important graphic on this page is like all of you, we have figured out this virtual thing mostly, right? There are still glitches. We still learn something new every day. But the piece I have yet to figure out is how to do candy, how to do chocolate. So if we were together in person, I would have a bag of chocolate and our goal would be collectively, our goal would be for me to leave with an empty bag because me with a bag of chocolate and my candy is not a good plan. So I would pass around the bags, the bag until it was empty. I've yet to figure out how to do that virtually. I know virtual candy is better from a calorie perspective because there aren't any, but I don't think it tastes as good. So what I've been saying to folks is I owe you, which means not if, but when, when I see you at some point in the community, feel free to cash in. Tell me I owe you some chocolate and I'm happy to do it. So that's your easy homework assignment is to cash in on the chocolate. 
So we are based uh, here in Durham, hence the Durham Bulls um, logo there, but we do work statewide and we are part of Coastal Horizons, which is based in Wilmington, which is how we as a middle of the state program got the word coastal in our name. We're part of their criminal justice services program and we've been with them for about five years. We existed as a standalone before and now we're one of their programs. So our children's place in our statewide work, our focus is on community support for children of incarcerated and returning parents. And just like that group in Europe, we were very deliberate a few years ago and by adding and returning, <clears throat> excuse me, because we know we have lots of folks who go to jail, some go on to prison, and then many of whom are released. And so thinking about what does it mean for a child along that whole continuum, a, a parent's arrested, goes to jail, maybe onto prison and then released. So thinking about that along that continuum. And so we're really working to create communities where kids are recognized. So we move away from this whole, oh, well, not in my community, not in my school, not in my town, not in my county. Kids like that live somewhere else. Instead saying, no, we have children of incarcerated and returning parents in all of our communities. So making sure they're recognized making sure they are supported rather than shamed and stigma, stigmatized. So I think about how do we increase the support, how to re reduce the shame and stigma, making sure that they have an opportunity, they're encouraged, they, that we create a space for them to share their stories. I am not an expert on children of incarcerated parents. I, I had a phone call just before I logged in here tonight and someone said, oh, I know you're an expert and you're passionate. I had to correct her. I said, I'll agree I'm passionate, but I'm not an expert. The experts are the children of incarcerated parents. So do we create opportunities? Do we create a place for them to say, hey, this is what's working. This is what's not working. Can I tell you about my mom? Here's what I'm concerned about. So thinking about creating those opportunities for them. So we spend considerable amount of our time doing things like this evening, educating professionals. And what I would say is I'm not educating professionals on how to do their jobs. Folks are doing great jobs. What I'm saying is, when you think about supporting children of incarcerated parents, do you have tools and resources, kind of a go-to place if you have questions or you need more information? So thinking about that. Now, you all Zoomed in here tonight, again, some professional, some personal, but if you are part of another group that you might be interested, of course, would uh, let me know how we can make that happen. But we also spend some time looking at how do we support relationships between children and their incarcerated parents. And while we've been able to go virtual with the first piece, we've not been able to go virtual for the second because this is programming that happens in our prisons. And prison visits and jail visits for the most part have been shut down since last March. They're slowly coming back, but it's meant that we haven't been able to do that. And, and we're eager to get back in and doing some of those activities. Most of what we do is called Parent Day, and you'll hear me reference that. And it's an opportunity to really support that by doing some activities that kids and their parents be doing if the parents weren't incarcerated. And then the final piece is really looking at, hey, what's working? What's not working? What should we be doing here in the state? That's part of what you see in our Facebook page or what we or what we tweet about is, hey, we learned about this program that's happening in Michigan. Should that be happening here in North Carolina? Uh, really thinking about where kids find themselves. So what's happening in our schools and our after-school programs, faith communities, social services, any of those are, do we have there to support children because that's where they are physically or virtually that's where they are so this is your your first homework assignment i'm just going to go quickly if you have a chance click on this link and watch this i shared it with our advisory board a few months ago and heard great comments about whoa i had to watch it thing to think about so that's your first homework assignment one concern or a number one concern. I used to run the domestic violence agency in Orange County, Chapel Hill. And so for me, both personally and professionally, that's a concern is that we would not support a relationship if it's not safe for the child, however we define safe. But let's say that's the case. Let's Melissa, say, it's just, yeah. Is it possible? I'm glad Camille asked. I was just thinking the same thing. Would it be possible for you to paste that link into the chat box? Sure, let me do that. Can I do that at the end? Yep, you sure can. Okay. And we can if include I, it in the follow up email as well. Perfect. Yep. Um, and again, I'm happy to make the PowerPoint available to anyone who's interested or Amy, if I can send it to you, like I'm happy to share it with folks. So all of those resources, but I will definitely post that link. Um, as, yeah, so let's say a judge has issued an order saying a, a parent cannot have contact with a child. It's not safe. I would still ask the question, who's the adult? Who is the big person in the child's life? 
who's gonna be available to answer questions and provide support. Because for many kids, it's not a case of out of sight, out of mind. It's a case of, am I gonna ever see my dad again? Can I talk to my mom on the phone? Why can't I visit? Is this a forever situation? And while I'm not necessarily suggesting that's a role for professionals, I think about professionals who are working and supporting families is to identify who would be the person that a child could talk to about this. Another piece of the approach is we look at this from what's going on in our communities. And this goes back a little bit about, you know, what's going on in our schools and our after school programs is what is available to support children and what could be, what should have been, what was in place before that went away. But we also look at this from the corrections perspective because that's where the parents are. And I think about this in two parts. So parents are in our jails and our prisons. And so I look at this from the parent perspective. Is the parent able to access services? So can they, are they able to access mental health and or substance use services? Can they earn a GED? Can they take a parenting class? Because those things you know, obviously affect the parents, the big people, but they trickle down for kids. So if a parent's able to access a parenting class, that's usually of benefit to the child. So what's available for parents to access? But then the other piece of it is what goes on in a jail or prison? And so when we go back to visits, when, when children and families are able to visit, how are they treated? What do they have to go through to make a visit happen? How do they see their parents being treated? So if a family comes to visit, are they viewed as, oh, you're one of those families visiting one of these people? Or is it, oh, you're a family coming here to visit your loved one. We're gonna help you through this process. Kids pick up on that. So I think about both, both of those things happening within our corrections world. Now, one of your homework assignments might be, I'm kind of curious, is to find out. So most of us have a jail in our community. Some of us have prisons, but not all, is to make some phone calls, in particular for a jail. Is there a parenting class offered in your county jail? And if not, what would it take to make that happen? Now, granted, this is not a great time to start a new program, but it's a great time to plan to start a new program. We have all kinds of amazing parenting programs in many of our communities. What would it take to make that happen in a jail? So I throw that out to you. If you get a response, I'd love to hear it because I throw that out to every group and um, don't get a lot of responses, I think, because people don't get their own responses when they reach out to jails. So thinking about that. And then as a final piece of the approach is asking that really tough question about what's in the child's best interest and being willing to listen to the answer. I think sometimes we as the adults have it in our mind that we know what's in the child's best interest. We never ask, we just know what, what feels good and comfortable for us. So say to me, I don't think any child should ever go visit any parent in any jail or prison at any point. And that makes me nervous when we make those blanket statements, because for me, that's saying we're not looking at a particular situation, a particular child. We're just making this blanket statement. There are times where it's probably not appropriate, but we don't know until we look at the particular situation, the particular child. On the other hand, I have a former board member whose daughter is a recent college graduate, and she has never wanted a relationship with her dad, has never wanted to visit or talk on the phone. And her mom's always said, I, I'm not going to force her. If as a young adult, she wants that relationship, I'll be there to support her, but I've never forced her, nor would I ever force her to have that relationship. So kind of thinking about it on those two, um, two ends of the spectrum. A couple of things that we believe in, one is children knowing the truth about where their parent is in a way that's age appropriate and that allows you to build on it and that we do support relationships if it's safe and appropriate. And that include, include writing letters or sending pictures, it include phone calls, visits when those start to happen again, or a combination of those things. We have gotten such just amazing questions about things like how to tell a child the truth, how to prepare for a visit, how to even find parent is that I put together a second PowerPoint uh, that has all that information in it, and I've been updating it as the changes have happened in, in prison visits. So if that's something you're interested in, I'm happy to send it to you. It has a lot of really good links about telling the truth, about preparing. It's not nearly as snazzy as this one. It doesn't have cool graphics, but it's very factual, very logistics uh, focused. So if it's something you're interested in, you can email me afterwards or put it in the chat box. And I just call it my second PowerPoint. It doesn't even have a cool name. It's just my second PowerPoint. But if that's a resource for you and you th think would be helpful, I'm happy to share it with folks. So a couple of things I'm going to do in terms of what we've learned. So I'm going to do just one slide with statistics, um, because even if you were eating chocolate right now and have a little bit of a sugar boost, um, you get to more than one side with statistics. And I think people's eyes start to glaze over. So we're going to do one. If there's something that's not on that slide or you want more information or you want to dig deeper, let me know. I'm happy 
happy to follow up with you. Um, I always put awareness on at least one slide because that's the number one response I get from professionals across the state. And we actually have a map on our website. I call it my Where's Waldo map that shows every county that we've ever presented in. And so if we're not, if your county's not colored in, let me know. But the number one response I get from folks is I have never thought about children of incarcerated parents. It's not that I don't care. It's that no one has ever asked me to think about children of incarcerated parents. So that might be a question for you. This goes back to that early challenge. Have you been? If not, can you start? And if you have, can you get someone else to start thinking about it? Um, impacts, I'm going to do just a couple of slides about impacts. There's more information in the, in the uh, packet of handouts. I think there's just general consensus like, yes, it does have an impact on children. I like to spend more time thinking about, but how can we support? If we recognize impacts, how can we support? And then speaking of support, as you can see, I'm a big fan of you because I put you in all caps. So I'm a big believer that there are things we can do individually as part of organizations and as part of communities to support children of incarcerated and returning parents. There's not one particular place that you send them or can do it all or takes care of the whole situation. Instead to say, where in the community, where are the resources, how do kids take and then my final thing on this slide is I'd love us to move away from the services for those children, capital T, capital S, capital T, capital C. First of all, they're not those children, right? There are children. And for me, when we say the services, that implies that there's this, I don't know, neat little package with a bow, neat little suite of services that every child needs, right? And you all with your personal or professional experience know that's not the case. Kids have varying needs depending on who they are, their age, their, their stage in development, their interaction and their relationship with their parent, what they need today might vary from what they need tomorrow, right? So instead of saying the services, be willing to say, what is it a particular child needs? I have people say to me, I think every school should have a support group. And I'll say, well, I think that's a school decision. And I think that's a decision based on what students need. So moving away from the services, instead saying, what does a particular child need? Now, what you don't see on this slide, but I have it as a big purple reminder on my notes is that what I, this is what I call my promise slide in that I promise this is the last slide I'll read to you. I don't know about you, but I find it's dreadful when people read their PowerPoints to me, right? So I'm not going to read. I'm going to pick out specific things that I think are particularly important, but again, happy to send the whole PowerPoint for you to have as a resource later on. So look, there's a little purple flower at the bottom, which must mean this is a homework assignment. So do these questions, okay? What I always say to folks is the questions are guaranteed. Here they are, they're on the screen. What's not guaranteed though are the answers. Because you may look at these questions about what do kids need, what do I need to support them, what do parents need, but the answers might be something you need to think about or you need to take back to your organization and say, how do we find the answers? So here are the questions, the answers are pending. The questions will show up on a couple other slides at the bottom as just kind of a little reminder of, oh, right, here are the questions we're thinking about. What I will point out is you can see that last bubble about what do the parents need, it's parents with an asterisk, because what I'm going to encourage you to think about is not only who's caring for the child, so maybe it's the other parent, grandparent, foster parent, regardless, what do they need for themselves and to support the child, but also what does the incarcerated parent need in order for them to continue being a parent, and maybe that's something you hadn't thought about before, you thought about what the caregiving parent needs or what you need if that's your situation, but maybe not thinking about what the incarcerated parent needs. So thinking about parents, both caregiving and incarcerated. So there are the questions. Again, no guaranteed answers, but there are the questions to get things started. So why are we even having this conversation, right? Like, why did you decide to zoom in today? Why am I in front of you here this evening? So I think about reframing gossip conversations. So I'll be honest, I gossiped. I don't think I have today, but you know, we still have a few hours left and tomorrow's a whole new day. I'm off tomorrow, right? A whole day of possible gossiping. I can't control what anyone else does. I can control if I gossip. But what I can do is encourage folks, including myself, to reframe those gossip conversations. So those conversations are things like, did you hear little Johnny's dad got arrested last night? Did you hear little Johnny's mom was sentenced to four years in prison? Did you hear little Johnny's dad's coming home in two weeks? Reframing that is, what do you think it means for little Johnny who witnessed his dad being arrested last night? What do you think it means for little Johnny who learned that his mom's gonna be gone for four years? What do you think it means for little Johnny who learned or is about to learn that his dad's coming home in two weeks? So reframing those gossip conversations. 
I also think about parenting from prison. You know, you don't lose your parental rights. They're not terminated when you go to jail or prison. They may through a part of a whole separate process, but that's not something that happens automatically because you've gone to jail or prison. And so if we do that, we recognize that, then we think about, we have lots of folks who have gone to jail or prison, many of whom are parents and a certain subset of that who want to continue being parents, both while they're incarcerated and then upon release. So thinking about what does it take to make that parenting from prison piece happen. So I mentioned re-entry. I mentioned early on about us being deliberate to say children of incarcerated and returning parents. So that and returning piece is looking for re-entry perspective. Parents are coming home. Maybe they're not coming back to the child's home, but they're being released. So this might be a homework assignment for you. I kind of snuck put a little purple uh, flower, but to think about wherever you are, whether you're here in North Carolina or somewhere else in the country, or even beyond, I don't know, is to think about what's happening with re-entry in your community. Is there a re-entry conversation happening? And it's happening in many parts of the state, in many parts of the country, not all, but many. If you don't know who your re-entry re folks are and, and you can't find out after some research, let me know. I'm happy to figure out that we can brainstorm together. But one entry folks are, then to start to say to them, what are you thinking? What are you doing in terms of supporting children and families for that person coming home or back into the child's life? So looking at that from the child and family perspective about re-entry. And then I think about messages and, and kids get a lot of messages about having an incarcerated parent. And my guess is if we were in person that we could go around the room and say, hey, you know, can you give me an example? I'm gonna point out just a couple and then I'm gonna end with what is hopefully a more positive message. Kids can feel and they might hear this message that somehow what happened with their parents is their fault. You know, it's things like if you hadn't told them at school what was going on with your dad, he wouldn't have been arrested. We'd still be in our house, not this little apartment. Or if you hadn't gotten to fight after school, then, you know, they wouldn't have called your mom. Your mom wouldn't have been stressed. She wouldn't have started using again and she wouldn't be back in jail. And you all either have kids were kids, spend time with kids, you know that sometimes kids think the world spins around them. I did this, this happened, I must have caused it. And so helping kids understand that it's always the adult's responsibility, it's never the child's responsibility for what happened, reminding them about that because they may be feeling that way and that may be a message they're getting from family. Another message kids get, and I don't think anyone ever does this maliciously, but, I, but my guess is, I mean, I know I've done it and probably many of you, is when we say to a child something like, oh, you remind me so much of your dad. You look just like your mom. Well, what's the message behind the message? What do you think about my mom? How do you view my dad? Or I've heard what you've said about my mom. I've seen your body language, your facial expressions, the words you've used. I know what you think about my mom. And now you're saying I remind you of her or I look just like her. So thinking about, can we back that up a bit and say something specific? So, oh my goodness, your dad, is amazing. He can fix anything that's broken, right? I've seen him. It can be broken. He can fix it. And it looks like you're following in his footsteps. You remind me so much of him and his ability to fix something that's broken. So we're not just making this blanket statement. We're saying there's something in particular that reminds me and it's something that's positive. Not just in general. Kids might be hearing the message, but how does that trickle down to younger kids? So it's things like you know, going to jail or prison and serving time is a, there's a badge of honor. There's some glory. There's some um, positive attached to it. It's what happens in our family. It's a rite of passage. And so it might be older kids that are hearing that, but younger kids might overhear or have it trickle down. And I really think that folks who've spent time in jail or prison are probably the best allies in this to say, really, there's no rite of passage. There's no glory that there's a consequence when you're in jail or prison, but it continues upon release as well. So thinking about ways of countering that message. And then the final message or the final of mine, and my guess is the laundry list of them, is when we say to older, let's say preteen or teen, in particular boys, when we say things like, well, your dad's gone to prison, looks like you're the man of the house now. And how I feel like we're really setting kids up for failure because what we're saying is we expect them to assume the role of adult, of parent, of head of household, of whatever title we wanna give, but we don't necessarily give them that extra support. And then we act confused when they find themselves in trouble, maybe in school or outside, because they haven't had that support and we have these very high expectations. 
So I think it's okay to say to kids, hey, life is going to look a lot different. We have some changes that we need to make. Maybe you as an older child are having to give up an extra after school activity or having to get a part time job or provide some childcare, but we don't expect you to be the adult. We don't expect you to be the parent. Now, my final message is one that I think the community needs to hear on a regular basis. I think we probably all individually need to hear it. And that's the message that children of incarcerated parents and returning parents, but in particular incarcerated, still love their parents. And in many cases, want a relationship. Now, they may not like what their parents did and where their parents are staying, but they still love them. And I'm willing to say many, if not most children. In Parent Day early on, and the last time we did it was late October of 2019, which feels like a lifetime ago. But I can tell you, we had something like 29 kids and 14 dads those 29 kids still love their dads. I know because they said it, I could see by their body language, their facial expressions, how they wanted to be with their dads, clinging to their sides, and then the hugs and kisses at the end, and quite a few tears, that they still love their dads and they want a relationship. They can't do the relationship though, unless they have the adults to support them. So I think it's important for us to keep reminding ourselves, but to remind kids that we know they love their parents. But I think a second piece of that is to remind them that it's okay to love someone that the rest of the world might not like. Because you might have a child who tells you, I really love, I still love my mom. Of course I love my dad, but I'm hearing all kinds of really bad stuff about my mom and my dad. And it's hard to balance the two. So I think it's a two-part conversation. We know you love your mom. We know you love your dad. And it's okay to love someone that the rest of the world might not like. So a couple of resources here, and again, might be a homework assignment for you. So I know that Hollywood's not real. I, I know that in many cases it's made up, but sometimes I feel like pop culture references are the ways to get conversation started. It's kind of like when we used to ride public transportation because it was safe. You know, you have a conversation with someone on the bus or the plane. You tell me your whole life story because you're never going to see them again, right? I feel like it's the same way. Like if we can start the conversation about something that's not our situation, sometimes it can be easier to talk about it. So just two pop culture references that might be a resource for you. If you haven't had a, a chance to watch the movie Sing, I would encourage you to watch it. And I realize we're talking about kids. We're not talking about gorillas in this particular case. That's what Johnny is. But I feel like what Johnny has to say and the changes that you see in him might be a way to start the conversation with younger children or with older, but, but definitely with younger. Um, spoiler alert, Johnny's dad's involved in some bad stuff. He goes off to jail or prison. Um, and then he's, and I think you see an immediate change in Johnny's behavior and just his approach because he misses his dad. Here's the spoiler alert. Uh, so Johnny's da dad is involved in what I call a self-release program. So he escapes from jail or prison and he's back in Johnny's life. And again, I think you notice an immediate change in his behavior. So again, might be the way to start the conversation. Um, for those of you who are This Is Us fans or have ever caught an episode, you know there is a storyline in there with one of the families who's now the adopted family. They were a foster family, but now they've adopted a teenager whose mom has been in and out of jail and prison. And I'm convinced that she wants a relationship with her mom. She's just not sure how to make that work, what it looks like and how it factors and figures in with her new adopted family. So a couple of resources for you to check out, maybe a way to start the conversation depending on where you are and who you're supporting. So as promised, one side with statistics and just one, if there's something else that's wanted more information, feel free to let me know, I'm happy to follow up with you. So nationally, we're talking about 2.7 million children. I don't know about you, but I don't know what 2.7 million looks like. I don't have 2.7 million of anything, postage stamps, golf balls, uh, teacups, I don't have it. But I do know what one in 28 looks like. For one, there's a graphic on the screen, but I imagine a classroom. And I always think, you know, if we, you imagine a classroom with 28 seats and one child, or there's 28 children and you're picking one child. But your homework assignment here is, one in 28 is a compelling number, and I have cool stickers if you're interested, say, ask me about one in 28, but then what community you're in and what like in your community. So if you're in Guilford County or if you're in New Hanover County or if you're out of state, what does one in 28 look like in your school district? Do a quick Google search, find out how many kids are enrolled in your school district this semester, and then figure out one in 28. Because one in 28 is a national number. I think if we can bring it down to local, then folks realize, oh, this is my community. It's great, this US map, that's helpful. But for me to know in my community, that can be a particularly helpful piece of information. 
if you slide down, you'll see that uh, blue map of North Carolina. What we've done for the past probably eight or so years now is the Department of Public Safety, DPS, the folks who run our prisons, uh, they run what they now call their children's report. It's essentially a point in time count. They usually pick towards the end of January, at some point in February. They run a report and the question has to do with how many men and women in prison on that particular day have self-reported they have minor children. So as you can see, that 16, almost 17,000 number is a number with an asterisk. Because I always say to folks, it's the best number we have, but it's not the best by any stretch. That number, that question is asked about children when people go to prison for the first time as part of intake. So a particularly stressful time, they're being bombarded with tons of questions about themselves, which they may or may not answer. And then they're asked questions about their kids. And because of the stress level, folks may feel like they're, they're not capable of answering the questions or they say, I'll tell you about me, but I'm not talking about my kids. My kids aren't in prison. Or there's a concern if they tell what's going on that social services will be called and their kids will be scooped up. And if they've had a bad situation in the past, they're probably less inclined to tell. And in some cases for fathers, there's an issue and concern about child support. So they don't answer the questions. So I always say it's the best we have, but it's not the best. The other thing is all the kids it doesn't include. So I mentioned that I'm here in Durham. Let's say I'm a little one or even a big one, doesn't matter, I'm a child. And my dad is in the Durham County Jail. I'm not counted in that 16,000 because he's in jail, he's not in prison. That same child, I'm here in Durham. And let's say my dad is in the federal prison in Butner here in North Carolina. He's in prison, but again, I'm not counted because it's not a North Carolina prison, even though it's in North Carolina. And let's say I'm a child, I'm here in Durham and my mom is in a federal prison or in, in a state prison, let's say in Texas. Again, I'm not counted because while it's a state prison, it's not a North Carolina state prison. So we really think if we ask the question at a different time or others ask the question at a different time and broaden it to include jail and out of state, we probably would get a much better sense of the numbers. I mentioned here down below, there's a link to the Annie Casey Foundation, really good resources about a number of topics involving children. Of course, the place I go to all the time is about children of incarcerated parents. And so what they do is they say, yeah, we should keep tracking these state point time counts. That, that's good information. But let's also broaden it a bit and say how many children have ever had the experience of parental incarceration. So not necessarily today, April 1st, but anytime birth to 18. And that's where the numbers really skyrocket. We're talking about something like about 5.2 million across the country and about 198,000 in North Carolina. I don't expect you to remember those numbers. They're big and they're compelling and they're a bit overwhelming. But I point that out as a reminder to you that if we're talking about that many children who have ever had the experience, to just keep tucked in our minds that just because the incarceration over is over doesn't necessarily mean the impacts are over. So maybe you have a child in your life, you're caring for a child, you're supporting a child in a professional setting, who, let's say a, a young child whose mom served six months in jail. And so the child was part of that. And we think, oh, well, mom's been out for three months. We're good. Family's moved on. Incarceration's over, except mom has a criminal record and finding safe and secure and affordable housing is a bit of a challenge. And so you have a child who doesn't have an incarcerated parent. They did at one point, but they don't need more, but they're living with a lot of housing insecurity, wondering where are we staying tonight and tomorrow night and next week? Where is my stuff? What am I doing about school? Let's say you have a child whose dad served three years in prison. He's been out for 18 months. So at one point that child was part of that 16,000. They're not anymore, but dad has a felony criminal record. And for 18 months has been unable to find full-time livable wage, legal secure employment. And so now you have a child who doesn't have an incarcerated parent, but is still feeling and dealing with all that economic insecurity. So thinking about incarceration has ended, impacts no necessarily have. Also think about children who, unfortunately, we know their parents have cycled in and out of jail and prison. So you might have a child who says, hey, my mom came home last week. She was in jail. She's home. That's a statement of fact. Mom came home last week. But this is a child who has watched mom go in and out of jail and prison. And so you, they're home. Mom's home right now. But you might have a child wondering, what's, what's going to happen next? Is she going to go back? Am I going to lose her again? Also pointing out children who's fan, who's deportation. So their prison or jail sentence might be technically over, but they're not coming home. They're now put into a whole nother system around it. 
expectation. So again, thinking about not only now and the end of it, but how those impacts can continue over the course of time. So the next two slides are a reference for you, just a quick mention of them. They came about last summer when a group we hadn't talked to in a while invited us to come in and they said, could you please include some information about the pandemic and how that's another to, for children having an incarcerated parent. So I put together this information, I up, have updated a couple of times, but again, just the reminder about visits have been, suspended, but also programs and volunteers have been suspended at the prison. So uh, from a mental health perspective, you have parents who have not seen their children, who have not had access to programs, who've not been able to talk with folks on the outside. I also think about kids who have all the COVID information swirling around, older kids might be hearing, conversations about the level of COVID and testing and vaccines in our jails and prisons and wondering, what does that mean for my mom, dad? Are they going to get sick? If they're gonna get sick, if they do get sick, is someone gonna be caring for them? And then just thinking about releases, a lot of conversations about early releases, have they happened? Will they happen? What does that mean? And just preparing children for, you know, we might've thought mom was gonna come home in six months and actually she's coming home in a month and are prepared for that change again in their lives. In the middle here is a link to a resource from a group in uh, New York called the Osborne Association. And it's a really good handout specifically about supporting children with an incarcerated parent during a pandemic. And then this quote here at the bottom, I was on a call last June actually, which again, seems like a lifetime ago, where a mom was saying that her kids, like other kids at the time, were doing the virtual school thing and their dad was in prison. And she said, you know, my kids have extra time now to think, wonder, and worry. And I think she probably spoke for a lot of parents and a lot of children at time and wondering what was going on with my parent. So to switch slightly, to go away from pandemic to Sesame Street, uh, my guess is that you've all watched Sesame Street. Some of you may have watched it recently, maybe even as of this morning. Some of you may have been a while since you've watched, but I wanted to point out a potential resource for you. So a few years ago, Sesame Street launched a new Muppet and some new materials. Uh, the new Muppet is Alex. He's that orange Muppet in the middle of your screen with that hair, and his dad is in jail. And so the resources are a toolkit, English and Spanish. It's English one way, you flip it over, it's Spanish the other. Um, it's a workbook for kids, caregivers, and parents, some tip sheets, uh, sheets, and then access to a DVD. So it's intended for kids three to seven, three to eight. We've used it with older kids at Parent Day. If you can get past the Muppet piece, I think so much of what Alex has to say could apply to kids much older. So the good thing is Sesame Street will send us the kits for free. And so we are able to make them available to folks. So if you're interested, a couple of things. There's my information at the bottom. Feel free to send me an email, give me a call, put it in the chat box, but I'm happy to send Sesame Street to anyone who's interested. I can do it to home or work, street address or mailing, uh, mailbox, post office box, whatever works for you. Uh, I want to point out my favorite line from this. Uh, early on, you meet Sophia, who's a non-Muppet, she's a human, and she tells Alex that she can appreciate what he's going through because her dad was in jail when she was growing up. And about three quarters of the way through the DVD, Alex says, to Sophia that kids are teasing him. They're saying things like, oh, you're gonna be just like your dad, you're gonna go to jail. She said, Alex, I'm so sorry that's happening and I hope that it stops. If it doesn't though, I also hope you'll come tell me or another adult. And that's my favorite line is or another adult because that's us, right? There's something like 15 of us here this evening. Wouldn't it be amazing if the Alexes of the world zoomed in, looked around and said, oh, here's or the other adult. We don't have to be experts, but wouldn't it be great if Alex could say, oh, here are the people who are good listeners. They know a little bit about this. They can help me find some information. They understand I still love my dad and they're there to support me. So thinking about what we can be to, to be adult. So a resource, happy to send it to folks, you know, and I'm happy to get it in the mail to you. So we talked, I mentioned earlier about impacts, and this is actually a new slide that I've been using. It came out last summer and the article is at the bottom. There's a link to it, a really good article. I, I encourage you to check it out. But what I like about this slide is that I feel like it puts a lot of information in one place in a way that I think is easy to read, doesn't overwhelm. But this obviously talks about impacts. And, and you might look at this and say, oh, I thought about that, hadn't thought about that. Oh, that one makes sense. This one I need to think a little bit more. Mentioned about housing instability and the financial hardship. 
But let's think about changes, right? And, and I, we've been thinking about children and their parents and that change in relationship, but also think about a change in who's caring for them. So maybe I'm staying with my other parent because my mom's gone to prison and that's not some, someone I had a really strong relationship with, or I'm staying with my grandparents and I love my grandparents, but I, I want them to be my grandparents and not my parents, or maybe I'm in a foster situation. And so thinking about relationship change as well as my relationships with my siblings, have we been split up? Are we together? Will we come back together? Thinking about changes now when my parent goes to prison, but also thinking about when they are, when they release and whether they're coming back home or not, how those relationships might change again. So something for you to look at, look at and think about in terms of impacts. And as I said, packet of handouts is available as well. It talks more about impacts if that's something that you'd like to learn a bit more about. So just want to spend a minute thinking about barriers and what you'll notice on several of these slides going forward is that I always I have a sort of an easy out I always put others at the bottom because I don't want anyone to think this is an exhaustive list. These are some barriers that we've seen that families have talked about, but my guess is you can add to this list. So it ranges from lack of transportation for families when visits resume. How do we afford going from where we are to the prison, especially if the prison is far away. How, who's caring for me? Are they even willing to buy transportation or willing to support my relationship with my parent? Children knowing the truth or not knowing the truth. And I mentioned the second hand, the second PowerPoint that talks about that. Often this is a conspiracy of silence where families don't tell a child the truth at the beginning for whatever reason. And that's not a dig against families. Families make choices based on information they have at the time. But then kids find out, and it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when they find out. And then when they find out, there may be some difficulties with kids saying, why didn't you tell me the truth? Why should I believe you in the future? And then sometimes their kids are told, we don't talk about it. So now they're gone from silence because they don't know, but now they're silence because they feel like they can't talk about it because there's a consequence. And then some other barriers. So again, something for you to look at and think about, are these things that are permanent barriers? Are there something that we could work on and change so they're no longer a barrier for a particular child. So I am going to turn it over to Amy, who's got Oops, you froze on me. I don't know if that's my computer or yours. Can you hear me? People already. Okay. I want to ask if a couple of people would share their homework assignment, but it looks like we've got some people already sharing. So it looks like, yep. Got some familiar faces. We're going to add a chat to the link. Oh, somebody already added it. Thank you, Amy. We got some requests for the second PowerPoint. This is great. If you want the second PowerPoint, just let drop your email in the chat box or send me an email. This is great. Okay, PowerPoint link. I love it. People are doing their homework. Love That's it. That's right. So I'm going to turn it over to Amy. And I'm going to be quick because I don't want to hear me. I want to hear more of you. Um, but yes, and, and again, we'll send out a follow up email tomorrow. So we'll include it sounds like Melissa said we can share this PowerPoint. So you'll be able to just click on all the links that she has included in here. Um, and then another resource that I'll, I'm going to include is what this slide is about, which is um, a manual from the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. It's called Special Education Surrogate Parents. Um, and I just I wanted her to include a little bit of uh, about this because um, thinking about those students with disabilities that may have an IEP, an individualized education program, um, those students are covered under what we would call the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act or the IDEA. Um, and IDEA has six core principles, and one of them is all about parent and student participation. And so there's some very clear language in the IDA about who a parent is um, and parent rights and when parents need to be involved in decision making processes for students with disabilities. And so what happens is sometimes parents cannot be located or identified. Um, and in those unique and those are very unique circumstances, that is when the school um, can assign what is known as a special education surrogate parent. These are volunteers, they're not employed by the state education agency or the local education agency, but they essentially serve in the role as a parent at IEP meetings. And so there's a whole manual um, that provides guidance on the subject. And so um, this is just a little sneak peek of the front cover. Um, page eight has some specific information regarding incarceration. And I'm, I'm glad that Melissa mentioned this already. 
um, but super important that folks understand that incarceration, oh, you can go to the next slide also, Melissa. Um, incarceration does not terminate parental rights. And so those parents that are in jail that may have a child that has an IEP, they still have um, their parent rights. And so they still need to be afforded the opportunity to participate in those IEP meetings. And so schools have an obligation uh, like they do under, uh, for any parent, where they have to make reasonable efforts to involve the parents in the process. And so typically that would be, you know, mailing a letter home or shooting an email or calling folks. Now, certainly this may, there may be a barrier in trying to say, well, where is the parent? But they should be able to put out some feelers to whoever the child is, is residing with, maybe to say, um, can we get this information in the hand of the parents? And so they still have that obligation to try um, to locate and identify those folks. They have to make reasonable efforts and they have to document them. So there needs to be documentation that says, hey, we did try to contact them on such and such date. Here's how we tried to do it. These are the efforts that we made. It's not just a one and done. There's usually numerous uh, attempts uh, because they can and should still invite incarcerated parents to the IEP meetings. And we certainly know now under COVID that we have all kinds of ways that folks are able to participate um, when you can't be in person, such as virtually um, or by phone. And so that may take a little bit of legwork, but it still is doable. Um, some facilities will allow it. And so it's making those connections and finding out if you are here as somebody that works for a school district, you know, finding out what is our plan um, and, and who do we, who will we contacted to see how we might need to make this work in those unique situations. Um, because really the IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act is all about providing meaningful participation. Um, you know, we believe at ECAC that parents are uh, the experts on their child and um, know them the longest and care the most, regardless of uh, whether they are in jail or not. Um, a lot of them can provide really important input um, to the IEP team and help in the decision-making process, especially if they know what works for their kiddo or what doesn't, or maybe there's some relevant um, things that we don't know about the kiddo that the parent does. There's a part on the IEP that asks about, is there anything uh, major, a, a change of circumstances that's going to happen during the next year? So if that if there is a parent that may be, um, you know, having re-entry back into the home, um, that would be an important place to document on the IEP so the team can be thinking about how can we support the student in this transition, in this process. And so thinking about, you know, what are some of the ways that uh, schools can make it happen? Schools have an obligation, they have a procedural obligation right now to have and plan a place to assign surrogate parents um, to children who have IEPs where their parents cannot be located or identified. What would be awesome is if they also had a plan in place where they were already making these connections to jails and correctional facilities um, to say, hey, in the event that one of our children's parents ends up in your facility, what could we do to establish a relationship that we could still maybe have them virtually or by phone at the table to be a contributing um, member? Maybe, maybe it would look like um, when, student, when folks are creating the IEP, there's often a proposed draft maybe getting a copy of that to the parent for them to look at and, and provide their handwritten notes on to say, this is great, this might need work, or I agree, or here's my concerns, or you know, I still have a vision or a hope for my child's future, here's what I'd like to see kind of a thing. Um, so really trying to get those conversations going. We know that schools have to have something in place about assigning um, and maintaining a surrogate parent program, but what are they also doing um, what efforts do they have in place and where maybe where would there be improvement where they could try and get parents that are incarcerated um, to get them counted to get their voice heard at the table. I'm going to pass it back to you because I want to keep listening. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Amy, for doing that. And um, I, I that first slide, if we go back for just a second, that slide that has the page number, I, part of the reason I put the page number is I think the table of contents is mislabeled. So it's actually page eight. But in any case, um, it was a really good resource. There were lots of things in there that I did not know. Uh, and so that's helpful. That I'm going to tuck away that I may need at some point in the future. So uh, thank you for including that. And thanks to everyone for, for thinking about that from that school perspective. So um, my next couple of slides are kind of my, let's think about slides. As you can see, we were talking about the school piece um, and surrogate parents, but a couple of other slides about think about. And so these, I'm gonna probably pick one or two from each and, and 
think about, encourage you to think about. And as you can see, this is a homework one. So just ACES, um, and you know, the reality is there's a move towards renaming this with a P, right? So positive and adverse childhood experiences, but know that one of them is having a household member who's been to jail or prison. So I just point that out to folks as kind of a reminder, but at the bottom there, you'll see what looks like a deck of cards and there's one deck for adults and one for kids. And what I really like, and I keep thinking there's gonna be a way we'll use it in a prison program, I have yet to figure it out, but each deck, so let's take the child's deck, has a card for each ACE, and then it has corresponding cards about way to, ways to build resilience in children. So make sure that we're having both sides of that conversation. We can talk about ACEs, but that can oftentimes make it seem like doomsday for folks. This is talking about how do we build resiliency. So it's something you may decide uh, to order a copy of. You may think about sharing that even with incarcerated parents about building resiliency. Um, and it, because it's particular to the ACE, I think it's a great way to start some conversations about that. So just again, another resource for you to consider. Um, a couple of things here, I just wanna point out about technology. Um, and so I think this has become on the forefront of our brains during the whole pandemic about technology and access and lack, lack of access. So many folks in jail and prison, and, and this is changing ever so slowly, but they don't have access to the internet. So they can't be emailing their kids. They can't FaceTime. They can't just pick up the, call, the phone and call or parents and families can't just pick up the phone and call their loved ones. And so you think about kids who their world is wrapped around technology, right? If it has a switch and a battery and a plug and a cord, that's not gonna necessarily be an option for them to be able to maintain that relationship. And so things like old fashioned letter writing or visits when they start it back um, are ways that families can, can start to think about staying in touch. So I just, I point that out. Um, and then to go up to that bullet point ahead, just to think about for kids, like does the nature of the crime and the length of the sentence matter? And, and probably in some cases it does. So, you know, is there a difference if my dad was charged with killing someone versus my dad was charged with doing damage to a car, right? And nobody died. How does that have an impact on me? What does that impact look like? And the length of the sentence. So I think about younger children. If you say to a three-year-old, your mom's gonna be in prison for six years, that, that's not a point of reference they have, right? They're three, to know that's what does six years look like. Old children have a better sense of that, but just think about the longer the sentence, the longer time that they're apart, how the struggles may be more intense because they have that time apart. And for kids not understanding you know, they're coming home soon. Well, what does soon mean? Like, will they be here for the Easter bunny, for my birthday, for summer vacation? So that's part of why we put together some of those materials about telling kids the truth, and kind of dress some of the issues around the length of time, how much to share with a child about all the details of what happened with the crime. You know, unfortunately, or fortunate, I guess, depending on your point of view, it doesn't take much for kids to do a quick Google search and they can find out a lot of information about their parents, what they were charged with, what they were convicted of, how long they're going to be in prison. And so for not conversations, kids can find that information on their own, which can lead to a lot of potentially difficult conversations. So here I just wanted to think about kind of what was going on before. Families are complicated. Sometimes they're messy. Lots of things going on. Incarceration may be one of many, many things going on. So, you know, how much weight do families give to it? How much is it having an impact? Or is it on page two? Like there's so many other things going on. Incarceration is page two. How disruptive is it? If I'm a child whose mom went to jail, but I haven't seen my mom or lived with her in a few years, that's probably going to have a different impact than if that's my 24 seven parent. So thinking about that and then that middle bullet CJS, so criminal justice system is to just be aware of stress points. So a stress point for a child is a parent being arrested and then maybe going to jail and waiting for the court hearing and going to prison, possibly being considered for early release and then coming home. Those are all particular points in the criminal justice system, but they're potentially stressful points for families. So if you're working with a family, just to have it on your radar, like, oh, right, his sentencing is coming up in two weeks, or there's talk of him being released in, in six weeks, or I know that mom is set to come home later in the year. It's just to have it on your brain to recognize for kids, whether they know or don't know all the details, they're living in a home where there's probably increased stress and about what's going to happen with those particular points in the justice system. And then a couple other just thinking about points. Um, I mentioned about if parents are in the federal system or in another state, we can find them, like there's ways to go online and find them. 
Um, it ties into that second bullet point about deportation though. And I mentioned earlier on about impacts continuing. If a child has a parent who's facing deportation, I feel like they're going into a system that we don't have nearly the level of access. And so trying to maintain relationships is probably going to be a bit more difficult. Um, I have made a contact here in Durham who has some really good information about kids whose parents are facing deportation. So if that's something you're interested in, definitely let me know. Um, and jail visits here. So this is interesting and it will be I'll be curious to see how this unfolds as the pandemic continues, is prior to the pandemic, jail visits were usually non-contact visits. So they were behind, people always say behind glass. It was probably plexiglass, right, if we think about it. Um, what it meant then is families could go to, we're going to be able to have contact. And I think about younger children seeing there's mom right over there, right? I can put my hand up to the glass, but I actually can't touch my mom. I can't hold her hands in her lap, give her a hug, or just be next to her and how difficult it is to understand why can I see her and not touch her. The reality is as prison visits are coming back online, we're seeing that as well. There is going to be some kind of a barrier. So again, I think that's part of, if we're going to have kids do visits is how to prepare them for what to expect and prepare them to the best of our ability. And then juvenile detention. So I want you to turn your brains just for a second. I don't know about you, but I've been thinking about adult parents, but if for just a minute, we think about pregnant and parenting teens, again, can be potentially complicated and multi-layered and who's caring for the child and maybe grandparents involved and you know, a whole bunch of things that factor in is let's pause for a second and think about if one of the teens is in a juvenile detention facility. Or what does that look like? How do we handle that? How does that relationship work? And as someone pointed out to me just a couple of weeks ago, as Raise, Raise the Age continues to be implemented, we're probably going to see more because now we have older teens, 16 and 17 year olds, who are in still in our juvenile uh, system as opposed to moving to the adult system, therefore increased chances of pregnant and parenting. So again, just something to think about. And in particular, if you do work with a teen pregnancy program in your community, it's just to think about, you know, here's another, another piece of that particular puzzle. As you can see, the questions are still at the bottom, right? What do the kids need? What do you need to support them? So I said, going to be a little reminder to you to think about questions as, as you go forward with, with this information. So to think about taking action, right? We are going to be puppies of action and think about what are we going to do with this? So I'm going to point out two here at the bottom. One is another homework assignment that I wish my teacher knew. Might be a resource for you, might be just interesting reading, might be something you can share with a teacher about another, this is a very low tech way to gather some information about what's going on with students. So I'll, I'll leave that to you for your homework. But the one above that third bullet point down or checkbox down is about language. I'm going to start with the second one first. So we tend to use the terms jail and prison interchangeably. But the reality is they are two very different birds that create two very different experiences for families. Jails, as I mentioned, tend to be behind glass or plexiglass visits. They, they're not ideal in terms of visits and they're not ideal in terms of program. So folks who are there in theory are there for a short period of time, but unfortunately we know that's not true, that many are there for longer periods of time and they may not have access to programs. So parenting class, substance use, mental health treatments, um, GED, whatever the case may be. I'm not gonna say that prisons are better, but oftentimes they have a better setup for visits and for programs. So just to keep that in mind that we talk about jails, those are low one, usually usually by our sheriff. We all have one. Uh, think about um, prisons. Those are run by the Department of Public Safety, DPS. We don't all have one of those in our community. There's something like 55 in North Carolina. And then the Bureau of Prisons runs our federal program, our present federal prisons. And we do have one here in North Carolina, Butner uh, Federal Prison for Men. So just thinking about that part of language. And then the other part is thinking about how we refer to what we call parents. Now I have a list of about 13 different words that we use to describe men and women who are in our justice system, in particular in jail or prison. And we've all heard them. They're cons, they're convicts, they're inmates, they're perpetrators, they're offenders, they're felons, they're criminals. Sometimes we just call them the number they were assigned when they went to jail or prison. And sometimes we call them bad people. They're moms and dads. They're moms and pops and mamas and daddies, whatever. Let's use the titles, terms, and words that kids use. You know, I would never say to a child, so, How's your con mom? How's your felon dad? That hurts my stomach to say that to you on a screen. I would never say it to a child. 
And yet, what did they hear? Your dad is A, your mom is A. And then when they're released, when they come home, then they're an X. And for the most part, nobody wants to, because now they're ex-cons and ex-prisoners and ex-felons and ex-inmates. No, they're moms and dads. Let's leave that list of 13 to the adults, to the justice system, but let's think about what kids use. When we do parent day, undoubtedly, it oh, the little hairs in the back of my neck because prison staff will say, well, you know, the offenders, we have 19 offenders signed up for parent day. And I'll say, can't we just say we have 19 fathers signed up, right? Like, that's what they are in this capacity. They're not offenders, they're fathers. So think we use language and can we stop sometimes and say, I need to correct myself or I maybe need to gently suggest to someone else some different language that we could use. Um, again, we're continuing to take action. I wanna point out the middle here about um, take together apart. The, the other two at the top there are go back to not my crime, still my sentence. Like how do we acknowledge our own feelings about men and women who are in jail and prison? How do we acknowledge that? Sometimes we have to separate and say, I'm gonna deal with that later. I'm gonna focus on the child. And then think about who else should be part of a conversation. Is this something you would take back to your organization? Who else should be part of the conversation? How do you increase staff awareness? How do you start asking those questions? But together apart, this is actually an activity I'm working on right now. So this is on every PowerPoint that I do. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples of together apart activities. But a few weeks ago, someone said to me, do you have a list? I want a list. Can you send me a list? And I realized we don't have a list, but we need a list. So I've been working on this. This is a list of activities that parents can do together while they're apart. So I'll give you two examples. One's very simple. The other one's a little bit more involved. The simple one is at seven window, the front door doesn't matter. They look outside at the sky and they look at the clouds, the moon and the stars, if they can see them, the rain that it's falling, they look at the sky and they think about their parent and they know that at seven o'clock, their parent is also looking out the window or the door of the jail or prison and looking at that same sky, the same stars, the same sky, the same moon, the same clouds, the same rain, and thinking about their child. And they know the other one's doing the exact same thing at the same time, together, apart. More complicated and requires a few more steps is, wouldn't it be amazing to get a book, child's book picked by the child into the jail or prison and then get a copy to the child and they can read the same book together apart. Now they might not read it at the exact same time, but they read it. And so the next time they have a visit or phone call, they write letters or send notes, they can talk about that book. What did they read? What did they learn? What's their favorite character? What didn't they like? Together apart. So because I was encouraged to come up with this list, it is about ready to go. We asked nine families who have some lived experience with this, five with some of the things that they've done. And so we have what I think is a pretty amazing list of things that, that kids and their parents can do together, even though they're apart. So if you're interested in that, I would be happy to send that to you as well. It's not quite done, but it's hot off the press. And when it is, I would be happy to send it to you. So together apart. So here I wanna point out two things. Um, the Bill of Rights, which is, uh, there's a little screenshot of it there on the right. It's actually in the packet of handouts that I'm happy to share with folks, is to look at this and say, first of all, oh my goodness, we can't take on anything else. But then to look at a second time and say, is there one thing on this that we could focus on? Maybe it's the thing about, you know, kids deserve to be supported. They have a right to have a relationship. You pick the one and say, this is what we're gonna focus on. This is what our organization can do. Other things may trickle from it, right? We've picked four, but actually one through three came about as a result, but we picked four. And then think about sharing that with families, putting on your website, sending it home, posting on Facebook, whatever the case might be, but thinking about that and, and the one thing that you can focus on. The next thing is about including parents in activities. And I will tell you right now, this is guaranteed to be more work for you because you have to find the parent and figure out how to include them. And this can be very basic. This can be things like at the beginning of the school year, sending the incarcerated parent, again, if it's safe and appropriate, sending them the school calendar. How else would a parent know what the school year looks like? If you're closed tomorrow for Good Friday, if a parent doesn't has limited contact or they're not doing visits or somebody forgot to tell them, how do they know their child's not in school tomorrow, right? So thinking about something as very simple as that, but then take it to the next level. And so Amy was talking about surrogate parents and including um, incarcerated parents if possible. What I always say is, 
if there's a parent teacher conference, um, are we including the incarcerated parent? What would it take to make that happen? If a school or any organization sends home a newsletter or some kind of written materials, they pick up or drop off, they give it to families, they put in the mail, can we also make that available to the incarcerated parent? So thinking about being creative, recognizing it's going to take more work, but what a wonderful way to keep the parent engaged. What a wonderful message for the child of, hey, your mom's not here. Your dad's not know what's going on in school. We sent them the school newsletter. We sent them the story about you and your basketball game last week. They know. It also sends the message to the parents like, hey, we're not letting you off the hook, right? You're still the parents. And then if they hope to stay engaged when they're released, hopefully that makes that re-entry piece a bit smoother because they've been in a certain level with what's going on in their children's lives. So think about how to be creative. And again, if you come up with something amazing, please share it because then I can share it with other groups as well. So these are just some virtual post-it notes to think about if you're in a particular work setting, kind of thinking about some of this. So if you're in a childcare setting, you know, you might see a change in a child's napping or sleeping schedule or whether they're toilet trained. You know, the result of incarceration is that some of that may change. Uh, I think about what does Monday look like? And when we go back to visits, I think this is even more important. Oftentimes prison visits happen on the weekend. So just to have it on your radar that what does Monday look like? If I know I have a child in my program, my school that I'm caring for is su supporting whatever, and I know that a visit is scheduled for Sunday, just to check in on Monday, like how did the visit go? How are, how are you doing with all of this? Or if you know a child always talks to mom Wednesday afternoon, just to recognize what does Wednesday morning look like? What does Thursday morning look like? Because whether it was a good call or a bad call, good visit, bad visit, the fact is the child is home and the parent isn't. Like they had to say goodbye at some point. So I'm a big fan of let's make this a universal conversation. Instead of guessing, and sometimes we're not really good at it, instead of guessing or assuming we know which families have an incarcerated parent, let's just make it universal. Let's just provide the information to everyone and then families can decide when it's convenient and safe and appropriate from the access it. Maybe they're not ready to tell you right now, this is what's going on. Maybe they told someone two weeks ago and they got such a bad response. They're saying, I am not right now. But if you provided some materials, made them available, told them about it, then they can take it if they want, and then they could decide if they want to share it with you. So again, this is another one on my other list, right? Because it's not exhaustive. My brainstorming. But I want to point out two things towards the bottom, story time and the website challenge. So my thing right now is if I know someone's doing story time, whether it's a library, in-person, virtual, smart start, uh, after-school program, a child care center, if you're doing story time, would you consider reading a book about a child with an incarcerated parent? What would it take to make that happen? What would that look like? And last month, a child care center here in Durham was interested in a book that we had. I dropped it off. They read it. She said the kids loved it. They had a million questions. The volunteer loved reading about something that applied to some of the children. So thinking about what would it take to make that happen. And then I will want to point out a website challenge in just a second. But story time. So you're thinking, I'd love to do story time, but I don't think I have any books. So this is a screenshot of our homepage from our website. And then I did a drop down of the book lists that are on our website. So we update our book list on a regular basis. They were updated late fall. As you can see, there are four lists there. They're very detailed. I won't put a book on that list unless I read it, which doesn't mean they're all good books. It just means that I read all of them. So if you're interested, if you want a recommendation, if it's one that I have, I'm happy to let you borrow it conversation with your library. Did they have it? Can they get one? Can they add to their collection? You might decide to make a list available to families. You might decide to have some available if you have a waiting area or resource table, put some on your website, lots of places. But again, low tech, but imagine what it would be like for a child to hear a story about something that they're experiencing and for a child who's not experiencing it, but they're trying to be a good best friend. Right now, they know a little bit more about what their friend needs. So maybe it's the little book that comes with Sesame Street. Maybe that's the way to start it. Or maybe it's something beyond that. But there's a resource for you. If you come across a book that's not on that list, please tell me. I'm happy to, to check it out and add it to the list. Or if there's something that, again, you have a question, you want a, a recommendation or want to talk about a book, definitely let me know. Homework assignment and potential challenge. This is the website challenge. So I was not looking for the Wayne County Public Schools website. This is probably two years ago. Wayne County is Goldsboro, for those of you here in North Carolina, a big military community. So this is not surprising. But 
What I loved about this site, and it's where I put that red arrow, is that they have a link on their website, or they did at the time, with information for military families. So my website challenge to you is if you have a website, you're thinking about it, one's in the works, what would it take for you to put a link on there with information about supporting children with incarcerated parents? What I say to folks is you don't have to start huge, right? You don't have to start with the Library of Congress, right? Start small and build bigger. Put that Bill of Rights there. Access a link to the, to the um, book list on our website. Somebody asked me if I would put together a one pager, that they would put it on their school's, their district's website if we put together a one pager. So that's in the works. If that's something that you find helpful, it wouldn't be specific to your community. It would be more general, but that might be a way to get things started because then, then families can access it when it's convenient for them, when it's safe, when they have two minutes on their phone or they're doing drop off or they catch a break and they're able to say, I can do a quick search here before I decide to go any further with sharing or, or uh, letting anyone else know what's going on. And then a couple more resources. And what I'll say on the two on the right is you can ignore the, the titles because it says school staff and social workers. If that applies to you, great. If not, please do not disregard these. I put the links there at the bottom. Um, what I like, two things that I like about these resources is that they're new and, you know, we all have had like resources that are super old or look dated, but they're new and they have video clips in them with kids talking about their experiences, right? I go back to, they're the experts. So to hear their voices about this is what was working, it's not working, what I wish was in place. So two resources for you to take, look at, maybe share with school colleagues if you're not in a school. And then the middle, I realize it references October and that we're past October, um, but this CS Support Us is a national campaign that we've been involved in for a few years and planning has started for this October. This year, well, 2020, and again in 2021, the focus is on educational well-being. So I encourage you to check it out. Really good resources, building on a lot of what we talked about tonight, about creating safe spaces, about messages, resources. Again, encourage you to check it out. It's not, it's put together by the Osborne Association in New York, but it's not New York specific. Like we could use it, we, we did. And we will post about that um, in October, but I wanted to share with that with you. And it's, the site is still up, it hasn't gone, it hasn't gone away. So if you're like me, a uh, maker of lists and check boxes, my favorite thing is to check a box to say I've done it. So I know several of you put in the chat box earlier, some of the things that you were going to do. Um, and Amy, can people turn their mics on or no? No, not unless I go in there. No, no, no that's fine. That's fine. We will, we will be. Oh yeah, I can, I can allow to talk. I just go down the list if somebody wants to. This okay. is my first time doing this, so I'm learning. Oh, this is wonderful. Great. <laughs> so I know lots of people are putting in their chat, in the chat box, their chat box, our chat box about, um, what they're gonna do, but I'm wondering if two people could verbalize what they're gonna do from homework or if they have a question. Two people, oh, that's a low bar. Two people share their homework and or ask a question. Pressure's on, we've got 12 people left. So two people that would like to share with us their homework or and or ask a question. Yeah, they should be allowed to talk. They just have to unmute themselves. Looks like Amanda might have just unmuted. Yes. Um, I was wondering, first of all, thank you for doing this. It's very interesting. Um, yeah. I was wondering when we were talking about making sure, um, and I asked the question, but I didn't quite understand the answer. Yeah. If I were to try to go and talk to a school or a school district do, about making sure they have a, a running agreement or a, a protocol for parents to, to call in from where they're incarcerated to do IEP meetings and whatnot. Where would I go like initially to figure out if that's like just a school by school situation, the district, like how do I make that happen? I would probably just uh, start with directly reaching out to the EC director for that district. Okay. To say, you know, it's my understanding that you have to have a plan in place um, so that there's always parent participation at the IEP meeting. Um, to what is your policy or what is your, you know, what do you, what have you created as far as um, assigning surrogate parents? Because um, in that resource that I'll send out that I was referring to, they actually have guidance in there for each uh, local education agency that they can run with to create a plan. And they also have forms in there that they can use um, and a handbook in there to train because these are volunteers as surrogate parents are. But in that same note saying, you know, what are you doing 
to meet your obligation under IDEA for parent participation and how does that extend to incarcerated parents? Typically what happens is they send, you know, would send a home a note in the book bag. We got an IEP meeting coming up. They might shoot an email or they might make a phone call. Um, and so, you know, the, the language is, is that they have to make reasonable efforts. And yeah. some might look at that and say, well, that was reasonable. Um, but some might look at that and say it's not reasonable if your the parent has no access to the phone or the email or the book bag. Exactly. And so in those particular situations where they might be known that this is a child of an incarcerated parent, you know, kind of saying, what do you have in place? Do you, if you don't have anything, can I help you write something? Can we get something, get some folks together, maybe a subcommittee to come together and say, hey, what are we doing for, the, for this population of children? Okay, great. Well, I volunteer to make sure that happens for the district I'm with or whatever. Terrific. And Amanda, I would love to hear what kind of response you get and if there's anything that you can share about, you know, lessons learned, because if there are other groups, uh, my guess is they would encounter similar responses. So if, if you do have luck or even if you don't, I would love to connect with you at some point. I will respond. Yes. Thank Great. you. I've seen some districts from time to time will advertise. I'll see a flyer promoting saying that they're trying to recruit and train surrogate parents. Um, and in Mecklenburg County, the Council for Children's Rights, they provide a lot of training and do heavy recruiting, trying to teach parents um, or other folks in the stakeholders in the community to consider being surrogate parents, which is all awesome and wonderful. I just wouldn't want it to be the go-to response um, just to say, oh, we already know um, mom and dad are, you know, on, they're in jail, so let's just assign a surrogate. I'd like to see that they made those reasonable efforts before doing that. Um, and I mean, it is a wonderful program and there's some really awesome surrogates out there, but we should never, it shouldn't just be our initial response. Let's try and locate the parent and see if, is there a way that we can get them, their voice heard at the table where they can have some meaningful participation. Yeah, I can't even fathom them not include, I mean, I guess in my mind, I was thinking the parent person was like a third person, like another person involved. I can't believe now that I'm understanding what you're hearing me hearing what you're saying, that you're saying that they don't even try to, they just completely replace the parents with the parent surrogate? Sometimes. I mean, sometimes there's another family member that'll come forth and they and they can have the role as a parent. There's some foster parents um, that have that right as a parent. Um, it's pretty much true for all foster parents oh. except for therapeutic foster parents. Um, so sometimes they'll, you know, say, well, we're meeting our obligation because grandma's going to come uh, kind of a thing. And sometimes yeah, okay. grandma's but it's still, you know, they're, that parent it's is not, not good. If that parent hasn't had their rights terminated, they're still the parent and should be the primary contact yes. that they're trying to reach out to. Yes, because I imagine this has something to do with also with like when they're released, like just from the parent's perspective too, is the more in, involved and engaged they are with their children, the, I'm guessing the numbers would say that they have a better chance of not going back. I don't know the numbers specifically, but I can't imagine that it's helpful to have them completely kind of like severed almost in that kind of relationship. Yeah, we had a, um, a parent reach out to one of our parent educators recently that had um, recently been released. I don't know if she was in jail or prison, but got released. And um, I imagine just that transition alone, there's, I'm sure there's lots of challenges. And so the place where she ended up living was in a different county from where her kids were attending school um, and the school was saying, we're getting ready to um, report you because you, you live in this county and they're attending school in our county and you have an obligation to enroll them there. And it was just going to be, it was almost like they were trying to get her back in trouble again, instead of trying to say, how can we make this work or give her some time or, you know, some grace or something, or let's, let's work with the other school district. Let's work on this transition with these kids. And so sometimes, um, Sometimes it does feel like things are yucky and wonky and, and not happening the way that they should be. But yeah, you would think that um, involving the parents and building those relationships and build, you know, giving them some success in their child's life, that that would be a motivator for when, if they did get out to stay, you know, on the right track kind of a thing. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And I think a lot of yeah. that goes back. Oh, good. Okay. Amanda, were you going to say something? No, I'm just, I'm flabbergasted right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I think part of it also is the conversation about getting people to acknowledge, 
what they feel about folks in prison and jail. Because my guess is that's a lot of, well, first of all, it's, it's more work, right? And nobody wants more work. But I also think part of it is the conversation, like, I'm not sure I like them. And so therefore, I'm not going to try really hard. There's not a lot to encourage me to try hard to make contact with them. And, you know, the example that Amy just gave, like, it's a it, perfect reminder about that re-entry. Like, if, if there's re-entry efforts happening in your community, here's a perfect example of you know, parent coming home, moving to a different community, child's in the school, like that's a, that's a re-entry conversation and we should really make sure that schools and others are part of that so they understand that when they set certain guidelines, what it means for that returning parent and ultimately what it means for the child. Yeah, Can I get one more uh, like major assignment or question and then I will wrap things up. Anyone else like share their homework assignment? Okay, so this is the list. If I can help you with any of those things, let me know. I know someone asked about it being recorded that they thought it would be helpful for a foster parent group. Um, obviously the recording's available. If you're interested, I'm happy to, to come and do something virtually if that, uh, if that makes sense for you. But I wanna close with a quote from this documentary called Echoes of Incarceration. Again, another resource, I encourage you to, to check it out. I don't know anything about the speaker what he had to say was so compelling and such a way to, to wrap things up that I share it with, with pretty much every group. So he goes on, part of the quote is, to support a child whose parent is incarcerated, the support is genuine from the heart. A child can tell if you don't fully believe in them and their potential. And when someone does, it can make a world of difference. Remember, it's not so much about what you say or what you do for the child. It's more how you say it and how you do it okay. that counts. You have to really put yourself in their shoes in order to understand their pain and comprehend how to properly help them heal. Mm -hmm. So yep. there's my information. Again, it was in the chat box at the beginning, but there it is. Any way that you want to reach me, you can do it that way. We also have a contact us page uh, on our website. So if that's easier, I mentioned earlier about starting the conversation, but not ending. So feel free to get in touch with me if there's information or you want to, that you need or want to continue the conversation, whatever the case may be. And, or if you want to claim chocolate, right? That was my, my commitment to you at the beginning. I'm a woman of my word. So feel free to contact me about chocolate. Um, but again, thank you for the chance to be here for making time. I know it's the evening and you've put in a full day already. So I appreciate you making time. And Amy, thank you for the invitation and the chance to be here. I appreciate it. Thank you. This was excellent. Excellent. Really good information. So thank you so much. Excellent resources too. Yes. Great. Well, happy to answer any questions before we log off. Um, and so just either turn your mic off or put it in the chat box and I will copy the chat box and make sure that to send information for folks that asked for it. Well, great. Well, thank you so much. Have a good evening um, and a good uh, a good weekend as well. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks again. Bye. Thank you. Done. Done.